Welcome you to our midweek Bible study here at Havenwoods Baptist Church. My name is Ricky Watt. I'm the pastor here at Havenwoods, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, during these days when we've gone through the quarantine and now things are starting to open up a little more and uh, people are being able to, some are, have gone back to work, some have gone back to school already. Uh, it's such a blessing for us to be able to continue uh, through the videos to do our midweek Bible study. Uh, hopefully in the upcoming weeks we'll be able to uh, get back to meeting here again. Uh, in our buildings on Wednesday night, but even when we do that, we will continue to have the midweek uh, Bible studies recorded for you so you can join us, whether that, that's on YouTube, on our Havenwoods YouTube channel, or on our Havenwoods Facebook page. But uh, it's such a blessing to have you join us um, here midweek. And uh, we started a few weeks ago a uh, study through the book of Romans and we've entitled this study uh, the book of Romans the life of faith the power of grace the life of faith the power of grace and just understanding our need for God and then in turn how do we live out our lives for the Lord in a way that would honor him how do we have a daily walk of grace and mercy because we've experienced so much of God's grace and mercy we want that to spread through our lives so that we can be a blessing to others and show them that there's hope for them as well uh, one of the great uh, things of my life has been if God can do what he's done for me by showing me love and grace and mercy by giving me peace and joy like I've never experienced before. Every single person can experience that through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that's really the heartbeat of this study through the book of Romans. So I wanna invite you to uh, take your Bibles with me and turn to Romans chapter three. And tonight we're gonna to begin reading in just a moment in verse nine. So Romans three and verse nine. I wanna uh, as you're finding that, I want to invite you to join us this Sunday for our uh, regular Sunday morning worship service. We meet in the gym at 9 a.m., and we would love for you to come and worship with us live here uh, at Havenwood Sunday morning at 9 a.m., but maybe you're not comfortable uh, being able to come and do that at this time, or maybe uh, you live far away. One thing that's uh, just been sort of mind-blowing to me during these days is how many people we have watching our videos from other states and so I promise you that we will continue to videotape our services whether it's Sunday or Wednesday and post those to our Havenwoods YouTube channel and our Havenwoods Facebook page now on Sunday mornings we have live worship at 9 a.m. in the gym and then we also post that video at 11 a.m. Uh, on Sunday mornings. So either way, we would love for you to join us and worship with us. And again, we are so thankful to have you as part of our church family as we worship together each week. Also, on Wednesday nights, our students and our children are back meeting now. They meet from 6 uh, p.m. to 8 p.m every uh, Wednesday evening. So we would love for you uh, to come and bring your children, your students on Wednesday nights uh, as they have a great time of fun, fellowship, food, uh, and studying the word together. And so uh, we would love for you to come and be a part of that and encourage your kids to be a part of that on Wednesday evenings as well. So tonight we are going to uh, look at a topic that maybe isn't real comfortable to us uh, tonight, especially as we look at it from the surface, but we're going to look at a study I've entitled Guilty Tonight from Romans chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9 tonight. And the first thing I want you to see as we look at this study tonight is the first point I have on your outline, if you were able to download that earlier, if not, you can just follow along 
and write it down as we go, is the first thing I want us to see tonight is the incriminating charge. The incriminating charge. Here in Romans 3 and verse 9, Paul starts this section out by almost setting it up like a trial. And he's making his case for the guilt of all humanity. And in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, he says there, Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. So Paul says, hey, it doesn't matter whether you were born a Jew or you were born a Gentile. If you were born, you were guilty of sin. You were, each one of us carried the burden of sin in our lives. I always put it this way, that when you were born, you didn't have to have someone teach you how to disobey. You and I didn't have to have someone to teach us how to tell a lie or how to rebel against something that our parents tell us to do. That was born into us. And I don't think I really got a hold of that and, and really grasped that fact until we had children of our own. And it was like, well, I, I know they're going to be bad because they're my kids. They're going to have some, some uh, rebellion in their hearts just because of that. But the reality was that they were born with sin, a sinful nature in their heart and life. And every one of us were born with that sinful nature in our life. So Paul says, I want to give you uh, this incriminating charge here that every one of us are sinners. Every one of us are dirty and filthy and guilty in the eyes of God. So throughout the rest of Romans chapter 3, he lays out his case, just like a, a Perry Mason or Matlock would lay out a case, uh, yeah, a court case, and say, this is the charge, and now here's the evidence that you're guilty of that charge. Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. So number one, we see the incriminating charge. But number two, I want us to see the irrefutable case. The irrefutable case. In verses 10 through 18, Paul begins to bring up um, one piece of evidence right after the other of why we are guilty in the eyes of a holy and righteous and just God. Um, he, he begins to talk here about... Uh, Something that we talk about many times when we talk about um, uh, theology and things of that nature. He talks about total human depravity. Total human depravity. And what that means is, is that we were, every one of us were born guilty and sinners. That we were all born with a sinful, rebellious nature in our heart and life. And that we need to be able to understand that we're guilty before we understand that we need a Savior. That we, you know, it's sort of like a, I've said to our people before that you can't get saved until you understand that you're lost. You know, and, and so what he's trying to do here is make the case to the people that he's speaking of here uh, in Romans chapter 3 and to you and I that we are all lost sinners. We are guilty in the eyes of a holy righteous God. Now what's interesting is in verses 10 through 18 he uses quotes from the Old Testament that speak to our guilt and our shame before God. And the reason that this is important is because as Paul is making this case before these modern day Jews here, their first response is, oh, but what about the law? What about the Old Testament scriptures? I know you're talking about Jesus coming and all of this, but what about 
the, how does that relate to the Old Testament? So he purposely brings the Old Testament into play here as he describes the depth of our guilt before God. Uh, so let's look here, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. And the Bible says there, As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. Now, we would say something like, oh, but they're a good person. Uh, but they're a good provider. But, but this person would give the shirt off their back. And, and what God's saying here and what uh, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament is the fact that God says there is no one righteous, not even one. In other words, if we tried to bring our goodness and our righteousness before God, the Bible says that God sees that as filthy rags in his sight. So Beyond verse 10 here, we're going to look tonight at several examples of our guilt before God. And again, we're going to talk about it from the standpoint of total depravity. And we're going to start by letter A on your outline there is the depravity of the mind. The depravity of the mind. Look in verse 11. The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 11, the very first phrase there, he says, no one is truly wise. Now, some of your translations will say, no one understands. And what he's saying is without Christ, without spiritual knowledge in our hearts, our minds are sinful. Our minds are, are dirty and filthy. Our minds are guilty before God. And, and that's why he says here, no one is truly wise. No one understands. I think back to my days before I gave my life to Christ. And I would say that a lot of those days in my life were characterized as confusion. I didn't really understand that God had a plan and purpose for my life. I, I certainly didn't know what that plan was because I was unable to comprehend God's plans for me. And, and I think it's so important for us to understand, for, for those of us who may be watching right now who don't know Jesus, there are things spiritually that you will never understand and you will never be able to comprehend apart from knowing Jesus. But when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life and, and God begins to teach you and instruct you and show you things spiritually that you never saw before. And I know for me, when I gave my life to Jesus, it was like a light switch came on. And I began to understand things about God that, that I never understood before. And it's like somebody who's not a Christian coming up and saying, well, I try to read the Bible, but I just don't understand it. Well, we're not going to be able to understand things about God if we don't know God. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. No one is truly wise in our own mind. We, we are incapable of understanding. That's why it's so important that we do know Jesus, that we do give our lives to him, so we can begin to understand who he is and who he wants us to be as his children. Now, the second thing that I want us to see, letter B on your outline, is not only the depravity of the mind, but secondly, letter B, is the depravity of the heart. Our heart is depraved. Our heart is sinful. That's why when someone says, oh, well, you just need to trust your heart, it sort of makes me cringe because the Bible says that the heart is deceitful. And, and here in Romans chapter 3, the second part of verse 11 and the first part of verse 12. 
It says, no one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. Now, as, as I read that, uh, the King James or the New King James says, they have all turned aside. They have all, they have together become unprofitable. So what he's saying here is that our heart is depraved. It is guilty. It is sinful before a holy God. Again, th that is our standard. You know, we want to say, well, compared to, you know, um, a family member, compared to a friend, you know, well, I I'm really much more spiritual than they are. But friend, I want you to understand tonight, people are not your standard for righteousness. God is. And when we compare our heart, which is dirty and, and, and guilty, when we compare that to God, who is holy and righteous, there's no comparison. And again, we are guilty of that sin in our heart. He says, no one is seeking God. You know, I, I remember in the late 80s and early 90s when uh, the big phrase that was used for churches is we want to be seeker sensitive. Uh, my only problem with that phrase is the Bible is clear. It is not man that is seeking. It's God. See, you may be watching this right now, and in your heart, you may be thinking, well, I'm really trying to seek God, when the reality is God is seeking you. He's looking for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Now, once you give your life to Christ, and once you're saved, then sure, you can seek the Lord. That's why Jeremiah 33, 3 says, uh, call unto me. And I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. So, so again, once we give our lives to Christ, sure, we can seek the Lord. We can ask God to show us his will and show us his direction for our lives. But friend, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have a relationship with God, he's the one who's doing the seeking, not us. And we must make that clear. We must understand that in our life, that, that God is seeking us out. And you may be watching this right now, and you don't know Jesus. And I want you to know, friend, that God desires to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. But yet so many people think that God is just this uh, you know, this concept of, of good and, and, and grace and all that and love. But, but God's not a person. And friend, God is a person. He is our Father who loves us and cares for us. And He wants to have a personal relationship with you and with me. And so we see, let her be there, the depravity of the heart. He says, we have all turned away. We have all become useless. Again, uh, the Bible says in the Old Testament, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone off and done our own thing. And then we find ourselves out in that, uh, in that pasture alone, if you will. And we realize that everything that we've tried to fill this void in our hearts with has just left us empty and cold. See, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. He's the only one who can satisfy the longing of your heart. Number three, letter C on your outline, I want you to see, is that we move from the depravity of the heart to the depravity of the throat. Look here in verse 13, Romans 3, 13. He says there, their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been around an animal who has 
died and, and for several days it's laid there and you go to bury it and just that terrible smell, that just awful repulsive uh, smell that you, you, you have just fill your nose and your head and you can't hardly get it out. Paul says here that, that for a person who doesn't know Jesus, that is not a child of God, that our talk is foul. He says, it is like the stench from an open grave. I read years ago, someone wrote, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody wrote this, and it's always stuck in my heart. He wrote and he said, the mouth is a window in the heart. That if you really want to know what's in someone's heart, just listen to what they say. As a matter of fact, people can um, try to make you believe that they are whatever they want to, but their mouth many times gives a different testimony. There, there's a conflict in their heart and soul because what they say they believe and what actually comes out of their mouth don't quite match up. In the New Testament, the Bible says this, that out of the same mouth come praises and cursings and Paul says that shouldn't be happening. That, that our mouth should be a consistent witness to our love for God and our love for others. So he says our talk, he says there in verse 13, that our throat is like an open tomb. It, it, is, it is filthy, it is nasty, it is dirty, it is guilty in the eyes of God. And this is just one of the items that, that Paul brings up here as an indictment against our soul and our heart and our life. Uh, the fourth thing, letter D, that we see here is the depravity of the tongue. The depravity of the tongue. And the second part of Romans 3 and verse 13, he says, their tongues are filled with lies. Their tongues are filled with with lies. In the New King James Version, it says, with their tongues, they have practiced deceit. That word deceit there gives the idea of trickery. Somebody who tries to use and manipulate people. And again, so many of these things that we're talking about here, we are seeing lived out in our world right now, today, in our society and culture people who are trying to manipulate us and, and, and jerk us around and, and, and try to push the buttons in our hearts and lives to get us to respond a certain way to whatever they're trying to tell us. And, and the fact is, he says, that's what a, a, a lost man, a lost culture, a lost society does. And yet we wonder, well, why don't people tell the truth? Why, why, don't people, why aren't people just honest? Because that's not what a godly person is. That's not what a godly person does. He says here, their tongues are filled with lies. So, so when people are telling you with their mouth who they are, maybe we need to listen and understand that that speaks to who they really are in their heart and their life. We are depraved in our tongues. And then uh, letter E on your outline. Number five is the depravity of the lips. Again, there in Romans 3, verse 13, and the third part, letter C, uh, or, or, or the C part of Romans 3, 13, it says there, the poison of asp are under their lips. Now, an asp is a snake. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, snake venom drips from their lips. Now, that, that's pretty serious. But Paul's not sugarcoating anything here. He's saying if you don't know God and you don't have a relationship with God, you are convicted 
by the fact that you are guilty. You are a guilty sinner before God. And one of those exhibits that he brings in for the people to understand and consider is the depravity of our lips. Again, that we will praise God on Sunday and we will curse him on Monday. And again, Paul says that shouldn't be happening. That should not be true in the life of a child of God. It goes back to, as I read that, I think back to the beginning of Genesis when the serpent comes to Eve and he's telling her all kinds of lies. You know, did God not say, you know, he begins to question what God said and he begins to try to, to manipulate her to get her to do what he wanted to do ultimately to eat of the fruit so that sin will enter into her heart. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I heard someone years ago say that uh, Satan's still using the same tactics that he used in the Garden of Eden because they still work. We still allow the enemy to whisper in our ears and tell us things. And if we're not saturated with the Word of God, if our heart is not filled with His Word, we will listen to those lies. And so he says, our lips are depraved, that, that we speak and say things that aren't true. And, and he says, we need to confess that to God. We need to get that right before the Lord. The next one that he speaks of here, letter F on your outline, is the depravity of the mouth. The depravity of the mouth. In Romans 3, 14. He says there, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He describes our mouths as being full of cursing and bitterness. Now the word that he uses here uh, for cursing gives the idea of to bring judgment on. And I think we really need to be mindful and thoughtful of, of when our anger starts to get the best of us and we just really want to let someone have a piece of our mind, when we really want to just rip someone up, chop them up like a Ginsu knife with our tongue, that when we think of cursing someone, that what we're really doing is we're asking God to bring judgment on them. We need to think about that. That, that if we are just really um, lax in how we use our mouth and the way that we speak to people, do we really mean to bring a curse on them when we curse them? I, I mean, I, that word's almost just become an acceptable word, cursing. Down here in the south, we say cussing. But the fact is, Paul brings that up as an item of evidence to our guilt before a holy God. He, he says, our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That word bitterness there gives the idea of open hostility. Again, do we not see that in our society and culture today? I mean, all you've got to do is turn the TV on and whether it's about politics or whether it's social injustice or the riots in the streets, the, the words, the things that people are saying and calling other people, it's just outrageous. And again, if we're not careful, we become desensitized to those things. We need to watch our mouth. We need to be able to say, God, I, I, my mouth has condemned me because of the way that I talk and the way that I specifically talk about others. So I'm just asking you, if, if you are a Christian and you are watching this video right now, friend, watch how you speak to others. Understanding that other people may have hurt you but you can choose to stop that cycle of, of, of hurt 
You, you can choose to say, you know what? Because someone hurt me, I'm not going to turn around and be hurtful someone else. Something that I say here at Havenwoods all the time is hurt people hurt people. And, and so if you struggle with how you talk to others, maybe you need to say, God, help heal my hurt. Because here, this the, the opposite is true too. Healed people can heal people. If, if you have been healed of those hurts, God can use you to help others heal from their hurts. So the depravity of the mouth, letter G. We see the depravity of the feet. Now I hope you see we started at the head, the mind. And we've gradually worked our way down here through the mouth, through the heart, and now we are to the feet. It speaks to the fact that we are sinful from our head to our toes. There is nothing good in us or about us apart from Jesus. So he says here in Romans 3 verses 15 through 17, he says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Again, are there three phrases that can be more descriptive of the world that we live in today? The New Living Translation puts it this way. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. And they don't know where to find peace. Can I tell you as I read that? I think of the fact that that was my heart before I gave my life to Christ. You may say, well, now, Ricky, you're saying that you committed murder. Well, Jesus said in the beginning of Matthew, he says, if you look at a person with hate in your heart and, and, and you, you may not have committed physically the act, but he says in your heart, you've committed murder. You are guilty of murder. That, that we need to be so conscious of the condition of our heart and, and, and the fact that this really matters. Again, we excuse it. We excuse it in one another now. But God says, I will not hold you without excuse in these areas. It says they, they the King, uh, New King James says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Again, we can go all the way from uh, the murders, the crime that's commit, being committed in our world today, all the way to the abortion clinic where innocent lives are being taken and killed every day. And God looks at us and he says, you are not uh, uh, without excuse. That's why we as Christians stand against these issues is because God says, that's not who I want you to be as my people. And now that's who you were. But once you give your life to Christ, God changes our heart. He changes our, our values, our character, our convictions. And we need to be different. And we need to be vocal about these issues. He goes on and says that destruction and misery always follow them. You ever been around somebody that just, they're, they're like the, the modern day Eeyore. They're always down. They're always negative. They're always critical. Well, that's what a lost person is. They walk in misery. They live in destruction. That word destruction there doesn't mean of just destroying physical things, but it, it means destroying lives, destroying people. And again, we see that all around us every day. And then in verse 17, he says, they don't know where to find peace. Now for me, this is the, the one that I can so relate to. 
Because before I gave my life to Christ, there was no peace in my heart. I, I can tell you that there were nights that I would go to bed and I would cry myself to sleep because there was no peace in my heart. I, I tried filling my life with all kinds of other things and it never satisfied. And then when I prayed, and, and part of my prayer when I, I gave my life to Jesus was, if you're really who you say you are, please give me peace. And I'm telling you, friend, from that day till now, there's been a lot of ups and downs in my walk with God. I've made a lot of mistakes. I have failed. But God has always given me his peace. And there's just no substitute for that in our lives. So the depravity of the feet, and then letter H, the last one, is found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 18, where Paul writes and he says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Letter H is the depravity of the eyes. That we must understand that our eyes convict us. Our eyes say that we are guilty before a holy God. He says here, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Friend, this is a serious charge. That again, you, you look around today and you say, how do people do the things they do and not feel guilty about that? And have no guilt or shame about that? Well, there's no conviction in their life about it because they have no fear of God before their eyes and so all of these things letter A through H that we'll just discuss each one is part of Paul's pronouncement of guilt against us and the third thing I want you to see and we're about to close is the indicting condemnation the indicting condemnation. And, and, and here in verse 19, uh, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20, Paul says a couple of things about our condemnation. Um, what First of all, letter A on your outline, every person is accountable. In Romans 3 and verse 19, the very first part of Romans 3, 19, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now what Paul is saying here is if you're going to live by the law, you're going to have to answer to the law. And the law says that every one of us are guilty. The law says there is not a single person that can live up to that standard of the law. And so he says every one of us is accountable. But can I tell you, we live in a day to, uh, a day, to day where people don't want to be accountable. People don't want to take personal responsibility for their actions, for their sins. We want to pass the buck to someone else. But God's saying here, you will stand before God and you will be accountable to him. The Bible says there's coming a day that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we are accountable to God. But letter B, I want you to see not only is every person accountable, but letter B, every mouth is closed. There in Romans 3, 19, in the second part, it says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may, may become guilty before God. I mean, it gives the idea of us standing before God and giving God excuse and, and, and trying to explain to God why we've done what we've done and why we've lived the way we've lived. And it's like God says, hold it. Just, just hush. Just, just shut your mouth. I, I don't want to hear your excuses. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. 
we are going to be held accountable and we are, our mouths are going to be closed. Because, friend, when you stand before God, it's too late to give your excuse or to give your defense. And that's why Paul is, is sharing this here. And then letter C, I want you to see, every life is condemned. Under the law, every life is condemned. Read there in Romans 3, verse 20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Speaking of in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So every life is condemned under the law. We are all guilty. We are all filthy. We are all shameful. We, we are all sentenced to death by God. Now, you may say, well, you know, hey, I've done wasted 40 minutes listening to you, and you're telling me that there's, there's no hope. No, friend, there is hope. But the hope is not found in your goodness. Hope is not found in your obedience. Hope is not found in your righteousness. Hope is found in Jesus. See, when Jesus came, he didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. That's why the Bible says we are a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So I want to close our time out today by reading uh, Romans 3 and verses 21 through 31. We're going to close out chapter 3 here. And, and then I want to share with you the solution to this verdict that we've been handed. Okay. So verse 21. The Bible says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus where is boasting then it is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So here's how I want to wrap it up, okay? Paul takes all these verses here in Romans 3 to show us that we are condemned by our sins. We are all guilty before a holy God, every one of us. That's why Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then Paul goes on to say, But we are justified by faith in Christ alone. That, that we don't have to keep a list of rules anymore. We don't have to try to be good enough we don't have to try to do good deeds to be justified before God but no our faith 
The Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you were saved through faith, and not of yourselves, not of good works. Because if it was by your good works, you would be bragging about what you have done. And the reality is there is nothing we could do to be made right before a holy God. But God sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross. And friend, if you will trust him and ask him to forgive you of your sin, this depravity that we've talked about in great detail tonight, Friend, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, you may be watching this video right now thinking, but Ricky, you don't know what I've done. Friend, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how you failed. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. We come to God and he cleans us up. He makes us right before the Father. So I would just ask you tonight, has there been a time in your life that you know that you've given your heart and life to Christ? Do you understand tonight that you are guilty before a holy and righteous God? Friend, tonight you can call on Jesus right where you are and you can ask him to save you. And the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if that's you tonight, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now just to pray a simple prayer to God. And just say a prayer like this. And again, you don't have to say it exactly the way I do because it's not about the words. It's about your heart calling out to God. That you would just say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I have failed you in so many ways. But tonight, I give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. To come into my life and be my Savior and my Lord, make me a new creation in Christ Jesus, and I'll never be the same. Help me now to grow and walk like Jesus every day. In Jesus' name, amen. And friend, if you just prayed that simple prayer or a prayer like that, confessing your sin, asking God to forgive you, setting your heart right with God, Right now, you are a child of God. That's who he says you are when you give your life to Christ. So tonight, I just want to encourage you to do a couple of things to follow up on that. Number one, tell somebody. If you prayed and you gave your life to Jesus, tell somebody. You may be alone at home or at work or wherever you may be right now. Get on the phone and call somebody and say, Hey, I just need to let somebody know I gave my life to Jesus. But secondly, I want you to share that with us so we can rejoice with you. We can pray for you. We can encourage you in your new faith in Christ. And the way you do that is to go to havenwoodsbaptistchurch.com and, and you can click on the connect button there and give us a record of what God has done. I'm sorry, I think I said Havenwoods Baptist Church, but it's actually havenwoodsbaptist.com. And you click on that connect button and just share with us what God's done in your life. And I promise you, we'll pray for you. If you gave your life to Jesus tonight, we'll, we'll send you a Bible if you don't have one that'll help you begin your walk with Christ. And uh, we're so excited about your new uh, found faith in Jesus. And again, there's no salvation and no other. That's why John 10 uh, says uh, that, that he has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And friend, tonight you can know that you know that you're a Christian, that you're saved, that you have peace with God tonight. Now, if you're watching this and you are a Christian, I want you to 
to, I just want to encourage you to take a minute and be thankful. Be thankful for what God saved you from. Be thankful that he is changing your mind. The Bible says renew your mind daily with the word of God. He gives us a new mouth, a new tongue. He gives us a new heart. He, he causes our feet to walk in righteousness and, and, and follow the Lord now instead of walking in sin and guilt and shame. And so let's be thankful for what God has done in our life. And again, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you Sunday, whether you're here live in our uh, worship service at 9 a.m. Sunday morning or whether you join us by video at 11 a.m. I want to thank you for joining us. I also want to thank you for those of you who are given to our church during these days. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. Again, you can send a, a check to Havenwoods Baptist Church, 7050 Lot Road, uh, Sims, Alabama, 36575. Or you can go to our website, havenwoodsbaptist.com, and you can click the Give button there and set up how to give online. But thank you so much for your faithful giving. That allows us to continue to do the ministry God has called us to during these days. So I hope to see you real soon. Thanks again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.